Aili amen Navai amen Tomatiam doeletne Oh Can is on Dani Pekane? Oh, can is on Dani Και τον τοπόν τεγένεθανο Και ζωντάνη πεφέκανε και τον τοπόν Πριν, 
Η Συντονιστική Επιτροπή Ποδιακών Σωματείων Μελβούρνη για τι εκδηλώσει μνήμη τη γενοκτονία του Ποδιακού Ελληνισμού ξεκίνησε μεθοδευμένη εκστρατεία ενημέρωση και ευαισθητοποίηση τη ομογένεια αλλά και τη ευρύτερη Αυστραλιανή κοινωνία με σκοπό να αναγνωριστούν τα δικαιώματα των Ελλήνων του πόντου και να καταδικαστεί η Τουρκία για τι βαρβαρότητε που διέπραξε σε βάρο του Ποντιακού Ελληνισμού. Ω γνωστό, στι 24 Φεβρουαρίου 1994. Η Βουλή των Ελλήνων με το νόμο 2193 καθιέρωσε την 19η Μαΐου ως ημέρα μνήμης της γενοκτονίας όχι μόνο για τους ποντίους αλλά για τον απανταχού γης ελληνισμό. 353.000 Έλληνες του πόντου εξαφανίστηκαν από το 1916 μέχρι το 1923 με σφαγές, εκτελέσεις, διώξεις, μαζικές εκτοπίσεις κυρίως γυναικών και παιδιών από τα παράλια του εύξηνου πόντου στο εσωτερικό της Ανατολίας, το Κουρδιστάν μέχρι τη Συρία. Καθώς και τη συστηματική εξόντωση, δηλαδή την γενοκτονία του θρακικού ελληνισμού και του μικρασιατικού ελληνισμού, όμοια με εκείνη των Αρμενίων και Ασυρίων. Ο ίδιος θήτης, αλλά διαφορετικό θύμα. 101 χρόνια από την τελική φάση της γενοκτονίας των Ελλήνων. Μια μαύρη σελίδα της ιστορίας και ένα βαθύ τραύμα στη συλλογική μας μνήμη. Άσβεστη παραμένει η μνήμη, αλλά και η προσπάθεια για αναγνώριση από τη διεθνή κοινότητα και την τουρκική κυβέρνηση. Οι Αυστραλοί συμπολίτε μας έχουν γνώση της βαρβαρότητας των Τούρκων από την Καλύπολη και τις πρόσφατες προκλητικές δηλώσεις του Τούρκου Προέδρου προς τους Αυστραλούς. Οι πρόγονοί σα. Έφυγαν μέσα σε φέρετρα. Αν έρθετε, θα πάθετε το ίδιο σαν τους προγόνους σας. Μην έχετε αμφιβολίες. Η Συντονιστική Επιτροπή εντείνει τις προσπάθειές της και ζητάμε από την πολιτιακή κυβέρνηση της Βικτόριας, από τον Αυστραλιανό λαό και την διεθνή κοινότητα να καταδικάσουν τις θηριωδίες που διέπραξαν σε βάρος του ελληνισμού οι τουρκικές κυβερνήσεις της περίοδου 1914-1923 και να αναγνωρίσουν τη γενοκτονία των Ελλήνων του πόντου, θρακών και μικρασιατών. Ο αγώνας για την αναγνώριση της γενοκτονίας των Ελλήνων συνεχίζεται σε όλη την Αυστραλία, σε πολιτιακό καθώς και σε ομοσπονδιακό επίπεδο. Υποχρέωση όλων μας να κρατήσουμε ζωντανή την ιστορία για τον αγώνα, γιατί μόνο έτσι θα δικαιωθούν οι ψυχές που χάθηκαν. Εμείς οι απόγονοί τους, Όπου και αν ζούμε, ακούμε και θα ακούμε τις κραυγές και τους θρήνους τους. Είναι η φωνή της συνείδησής μας. Από τη Σμύρνη και την Έφεσο, ολόκληρη τη Μικρά Ασία μέχρι τα Καωτίωρα και την Τραπεζούντα, αντιχούν οι φωνές και οι κραυγές τους. Μας σκότωσαν επειδή ήμασταν Έλληνες. Φέτος, για μια ακόμη φορά, οι Έλληνες της Μελβούρνης θα τιμήσουν τη μνήμη των προγόνων μας με αναφορές στα τραγικά γεγονότα της γενοκτονίας, στην ιστορία των Ελλήνων του Πόντου, στον ποντιακό πολιτισμό, με μηνύματα από τις προξενικές και εκκλησιαστικές αρχές και από την οργανωμένη παροικία μόνο μέσω του έντυπου και ηλεκτρονικού τύπου εξαιτίας της παγκόσμιας επιδημίας. Η θύμησή τους, θυμία μας ζωής, η αγωνία τους μαγιά στα όνειρά μας, ο πόντος ζει στις καρδιές μας και η διεθνής αναγνώριση της γενοκτονίας του ποντιακού ελληνισμού, στόχος προς κατάκτηση. Hi guys, thank you for joining us here at this uh, annual commemoration of the genocide of the Pontic uh, Greeks as part of the broader 
Greek genocide. And we just saw a video which I think is uh, quite, if you like, expressive of what it is that we commemorate today. It's a unique identity, the loss of that identity, and in the aftermath of what happened, a reconstruction of that identity, a discussion of what that identity means to us. And in the film that we saw earlier, we can see how certain elements of a very long tradition, a very venerable tradition, are interpreted and portrayed in such as a way as to ask the question, what are the strands of that tradition that make us who we are? What in fact is a Pondian? What is a Pondian identity? It's a question which, believe it or not, predates not only the Pondian genocide, but also the coming of the Ottomans as well. So the idea of who is a Pondian, what relationship does a Pondian have to the rest of the Greek world, and how is that identity negotiated within the context of that world is something which taxed minds of Greeks and Greeks of Pondos a lot earlier. And uh, I am going to take you in this lecture to the time on the cusp of the final defeat of the Byzantine Empire and the subjugation of Pondos to the Ottomans, a crucial time where these questions, uh, if you like, came to the fore. And of course, uh, in order to do so, we need to travel back to a time when things were not as they were are uh, now. Um, we're looking at the tail end of Byzantium. We're looking at the time just before the end. Now, we could say that people like Ivan Savidis, who you see here next to uh, Patriarch Kirill of the Russian church, has copped a lot of flack in uh, recent times by mainstream, if you like, and inverted commas Greeks, uh, about his uh, so-called provenance as a Greek. People ask, is he Russian? Uh, is he Greek? Well, these are exactly the same kind of questions, exactly the same kind of jibes that Pondians were receiving at the hands of other Greeks just before the fall of uh, Constantinople and the end of freedom for the Greek people. Yeah. Um, so let's go back to Pondos and the empire of Trebizond, a state ruled by the Komnenos family ever since the capture of Constantinople in 1204. And unlike uh, much of mainland Greece, the empire of Trebizond, the empire of Trapezunda, uh, ruled from the city of Trapezunda, was multilingual. It was polyethnic, and it had extensive cultural ties to the regions around it. So we're talking Georgia, which was still an independent kingdom. Uh, we're talking Armenia, and we're talking the East. And it's actually quite fitting that we're conducting uh, these talks over the um, over the uh, internet since, and we're all enclosed because of the coronavirus, Trapezunda was at the terminal end of the Silk Road. And the Black Plague back in the day traveled from China all the way through the Middle East up to Trapezunda. And then from Trapezunda, Genoese merchants took it to the Ukraine and then to the rest of Europe. So that just gives you an idea of where Trapezunda, where Pondos linked in. We have a tendency as modern Greeks to consider that our identity exists within a vacuum. Uh, that we were never influenced uh, other cultures and that we basically lived alone. And that's obviously not the case, and especially not so for Trapezunda, an area which is at the crossroads of civilizations where there was constant uh, interplay, discussion, and uh, discourse with other peoples. This was a time when the Greek world was asserting a Greek identity. Uh, through intellectuals such as uh, Yorgos Yemistos uh, Clithon, who was uh, an amazing intellectual. And there he is. Um, here he is in a, uh, portrayed by Benozzo Bozzoli in the Adoration of the Magi in Florence. Uh, reason why is because he went to Florence. 
He was the foremost intellectual of his day. Uh, he was asked by the emperor to represent his interests in Italy. Uh, even though he didn't like him very much, he respected his learning, believed that he was the best person to do so. Now, George Gemistos Plithon, and Plithon means stuffed because he was stuffed full of knowledge, uh, was one of those people who knew it all. And he lived uh, in the city of Mistra. And uh, he advocated the idea of solving the destruction of Byzantium by refounding it as a pagan state according to the ideals in uh, Plato's Republic. Um, in the other corner of tonight's uh, little intellectual jewel is his pupil, um, Basil Visarion, who most Pondians don't know about, which is a shame, because he is possibly after Mithridates, who was not entirely Greek at any rate, but after the Eugenius of Sinope, certainly the most famous Pondian in Western Europe. And he deserves a lecture all of his own. He was an amazing man. Um, Trapezunda at that time uh, was home to uh, Cardinal Visarion and um, he lived the multicultural aspect of that city. So we have, on the one hand, Mistra, just outside Sparti, a little town, the last gasp of Byzantium, enclosed, alone, living in its own little world. And across the other side of the Greek world, we've got Trapezunda, plugged into everything that's going on, in tune, global, where things are happening. And it is these two that are gonna to interplay tonight. Visarion uh, wrote a uh, work called the Encomium to Trebizond, Engomius de Trebizunda, uh, in praise of his home city. He did it because he was a very educated man. He was one of the most educated men in his day in the uh, style of the ancient classical authors who also wrote orations or panegyrics uh, to their cities. So it's written in highfalutin, uh, atticizing ancient Greek, not the Greek of his day. Uh, and uh, if you read it, from the outset, it appears like just praise for his city. And uh, Renaissance scholars did this afterwards as well. There's a panegyric to Venice, which is quite famous. This city is good because it's got this, it's got that, it's set by the sea, good air, good climate, nice people, good looking girls, the works. Um, so you would read this and you'd think, okay, Visarion loves his city and he's writing about his city and it's great. What does this all mean to us? What it does mean is that he is refuting paragraph by paragraph the contentions that Plithon is making and the prejudices that his teacher Plithon has about Bondos and its place within the Greek world. So actually, he's been quite cheeky. Now, Visarion's encomium to uh, Trebizond appears to be written during the reign of the ruler Alexios IV, Grand Komnenos of Bondos, uh, at a time when he was working for the emperor of Trapezunda uh, as a scholar, classicist, and diplomat. Um, and it is a direct response to two speeches that Yorgos Yemistos Plithon gave to the ruler of Mistra, Theodore Paleologos, who was the brother of Constantine Paleologos, the last emperor of Byzantium. Constantine Paleologos, by the way, was also the student of George Yemistos uh, Plithon. And the two speeches that Plithon gave give his outline for a future state. Um, Plithon's views are, that's Mistra that you can see there in the picture before you. Um, the ruins are amazing, definitely worth a visit if you are ever in Greece. Um, these views are interesting, Plithon, and they prefigure some of the prejudices of a lot of mainland Greeks. For example, he begins his uh, speeches to the uh, despots by claiming that the Peloponnese is the true homeland of the Greeks. Thus, 
excluding the uh, inhabitants of the broader Greek world from his narrative uh, and sporting a very narrow uh, definition of Hellenism. So Plithon says this, we, those who you rule and lead, we are Greeks, both by race, uh, speech and traditional education. It is not possible to find a land more appropriate and suited to the Greeks than the Peloponnese, the land bordering Europe and its outlying islands. It seems that the Greeks have always inhabited that area as far as men can remember. Now, Plithon, as we said, lived near Sparti, uh, Mistra, and he consciously used ancient Sparta as the model for his ideal state. Visarion, when he goes to write the encomium to Trapezunda uh, soon after, takes the polar opposite. Where, uh, Visa, where uh, Plithon talks about Mistra being a descendant of the Spartans, the first thing Visarion does, because he gets the barb, the jibe that Peloponnesus is Greece and everything outlying is not, he asserts Trapezunda's Ionian and by inference Athenian origin, referring to Trapezunda's uh, foundation as a colony of Militos in the 6th century BC. If one has to say the oldest thing first, this city boasts an Athenian origin for its people and Athens as its founder, the tutor of the Greeks and the mother of culture, the teacher of this most beautiful language. So where Plithon is talking about Greeks being those who speak the Greek language as it's spoken in Sparti, he talks about Athens, of which Trapezunda is a descendant, being the linguistic hub, if you like, and the uh, bastion of authenticity. The people of Sinope colonized Trebizond. Sinope had been colonized under the aegis of Athens by Militos, the most powerful city in Asia, the pride of the Aeonians. Militos used to lead this maritime Greece, not only because it was overly powerful, uh, as is known, but one may add, with grandeur. Now, he's being very, very, very cheeky here because Mistra, he knows full well, was founded not by Greeks, but by the Latin Crusaders in 1204, when Constantinople fell to the Latins. They were supposed to go to the Holy Land, but instead they went to Constantinople and conquered it, sacked it, looted, and then divided the Byzantine Empire between themselves. Well, the Franks got, uh, from France got Peloponnesus, and they set up Mistra as their own city. And even in Plithorn's time, there were a lot of Frankish people living there. So the first thing he does is he raises the questionable Hellenic uh, credentials of his teacher, Plithorn's city, which he holds out to be so Greek. So having fired his first shot across uh, Plithorn's bows, then he spends a inordinate period of time, does Visarion, discussing the history of Militos and Sinope, uh, two Greek colonies, just to drive home the Greekness of the ancestors of Trapezunda. There's a lot of that in this encomium. Uh, having completed this task, uh, Visarion proceeds without directly referring to uh, Plithon to then deconstruct his arguments. And the picture that you see before you is the ancient uh, theater in Militos. And you know, the ancient theaters are as big a stamp of Greekness, ancient Greekness you can get on the city. There are no ancient theatres in Mistra, obviously, but there definitely is one in Militos, uh, which is the mother colony, if you like, of Trebizond. There are other things that he then does to attack Plithon's view of what is Greek and what isn't. Plithon, in his writings, hates trade and commerce, and he celebrates agriculture. Whereas Visarion extols the advantages of trade, exchange, and the sea. I mean, that's what we know ancient Greeks to be. Seafarers, you look at the Odyssey, you look at the Iliad. Um, this is quintessential ideas of who Greeks are. Sea voyages. Plithon will have none of that, and that's because uh, Plato in his Republic was skeptical about the sea, was skeptical about trade. He believed that these things need to be limited. So, Visarion 
says this, and it reads like a argument for globalization, the global economy today. By itself, our city is no less robust than in uh, than any other in terms of what it produces and grows. But by accepting their products, it has become the world's common storehouse and workshop, a sea of bounties, as they say. Even the name of the Black Sea, Ev Xinos Bondos, Ev Good Xinos Strangers, so a friendly, hospitable sea, attests to its great benevolence and accessibility, and in a word, highlights everything that is good about it. The mere mention of the name Ev Xinos Bondos is enough to impart courage. Then he goes on, Fisarion, to, uh, in his quest to establish Trapezunda's Hellenic credentials, to subvert Clithon's love of Plato, claiming that Trapezunda's composite and complex economy, rather than departing from Plato, which is what Clithon believes, actually conforms to the very Platonic ideal itself. What you see in front of you is a idealized picture of Trapezunda, the way it was seen by Western artists. And what you have here is what's going to happen uh, a few years after this encomium uh, was written, which is the Turkish uh, siege of the city. Visadion says, the cities most or entirely satisfied with nothing more than land alone and goods from there soon have less than most since they are deprived of the goods from the sea. Even Plato praises and admires the ambidextrous people who can do things with both hands and praises the one who is naturally so. He suggests that those who are not so by nature should practice in order to be better able to use one and both hands completely. Surely, and this is our case, Trapezunda, should we not admire, cherish, and truly consider them happy who holds the entire sea and the land as one hand and one limb of the body rather than someone who would mostly use one part of the world. Again, being cheeky, Plato hates the sea, talks about agriculture being the only true pursuit of a proper ideal state, but because he also praises ambidextrosity, um, this idea only sees you on that to say, well, look, you know, you love Plato so much. Well, Plato said this. So you've got to admit that Trapezunda fits the mold. Trapezunda is more Greek than you would like to imagine. Stop making Pondian jokes about us. And Visarion, rather than feel self-conscious in the face of Clithon's conception of the Greeks as a people who isolate their ontology from uh, the others and shy away from cultural intercourse, believe that they've got nothing to learn from the outside world. We don't need the outside world. They have nothing to offer us. They are all barbarians, low lifes, um, people who we don't need to associate with. And the reason why Glithorn and other mainland Greeks of his time, right up until today, let's admit it, believe that is because that is a way of self-guarding one's supposed purity. Visarion, on the other hand, celebrates in his encomium multiculturalism. And when he does so, he articulates an ultimate form of Hellenism, which is, uh, I would argue, syncretic and open to all people. We, the Trapezundians, obviously, we intermingle with foreign people and we interact with all races. There are no cities or minds of men about which we do not know. We become wiser and better than them because we collect what is best from everywhere, selecting what is useful and trading in every kind of knowledge. And that is absolutely true. We find traces of Trapezundian merchants setting up missionary churches in Turkestan, in Central Asia. We find their traces all the way up to China. That is how amazing, uh, how cosmopolitan and how these people penetrated the rest of the world. It's a different form of Hellenism. Now, there's another stylized picture of Trapezunda. Both George Yemistos Plithon and his student Visarion, in articulating 
their version of the Hellenic discourse. They weren't just doing it for fun. Um, they're reacting to a looming existential crisis that's on the horizon. And that's obviously the fact that the Ottomans have slowly encroached upon the Byzantine Empire. They've taken over almost all of Asia Minor, except for Pondos. At this stage, they've taken over almost all of mainland Greece and the Balkans. There is not much left. Glitho, in his little corner in Mistra, is thinking, well, how can we stop this? How can we, as a people, rise up and either forestall or stop the inevitable? In his corner, on the other side of the Greek world, Visarion is doing exactly the same thing. So these appeals to Plato, to idealism, uh, they all mean something. What is it about our identity that can help us in this time of need so that we can preserve it, allow it to survive through the ages? Um, Plutón believed the only way to do this was to revert to the ancient Spartan way, create a military state, a state based on the 12 gods, a state based on military valor, a state which was uh, almost communistic in, uh, in, in its uh, conception because Plato talked about getting rid of money and using exchange. Uh, he talked about um, martial valor. It was almost a dictatorship. It was a place where the weak were shunned and gotten rid of. He honestly believed that that was the way to go. Visarion, on the other hand, held as a solution a more cosmopolitan, a more nuanced, a more, if you like, worldly way of dealing with things. He believed that it would be trade, alliances, diplomacy, constant intercourse and friendship with other peoples that would ensure Trapezunda survival because all these things would be necessary all the benefits of this would flow on to other nations surrounding the area. And what we have here is not only a philosophical duel between teacher and student, but also an existential duel. One is saying we got to get rid of what is not Greek in order to survive. And the other is saying, hey, we are just as Greek as you. It is a different form of Hellenism, but it is a more vibrant, more relevant, and in the end, a more existential form of Hellenism because we will survive. We hold the key to survival. You do not. That is the argument that has been played through the texts that both of them are writing. Um, he writes, we said, consequently, it was the Greek people who spoke the Greek language and tongue, who honored freedom and strove for equality, who lived they're all on their own in the midst of the barbarians who encircled them in large numbers. Our ancestors demonstrated immediately that they were Greeks, a race which obeys no master, is no one's slave, and is alone, free in mind and in body. They yielded nothing in terms of pride, dignity, and nobility of spirit, and did not do anything unworthy of their ancestry and reputation as Greeks. So Visarion is saying, we've been here before. We have been, as people of Trapezunda, in a situation where we've had to defend ourselves, negotiate our way out of situations where we've been surrounded by people who are our enemies and who are non-Greeks. And we've done so successfully. And our way of life shows that we can do this again. Now, Polython's appeal to Peloponnese antiquity and to the uh, Spartans and to ancient Greece didn't assist the Byzantines to resist the Ottomans. It failed miserably. He had advised the last emperor, Constantine, when he was the despot, the ruler of Mistra, to fortify the Isthmus of Corinth with a wall. So, and that's because that was something that had been attempted during Persian times. So basically, Plithon is reading his history saying, well, look, that will work. And Constantine thus built a six-mile wall across the Isthmus of Corinth, the uh, Examilium, as it's called. And if you go there, you can still see the remnants of that wall today. And obviously, 
waited for the Ottomans to come. And when the Ottomans did come, they came with artillery, not with spears like in ancient times, and they blasted their way through that wall and they destroyed that wall and took over the parts of Greece that Constantine had tried to retake for the Byzantine Empire. And that was the end of Blithon's dream. Surviving the fall of Constantinople for a year, Blithon died uh, just before the Ottomans took over his hometown of Mistra in 1461. And Mistra was the last place of mainland Greece to fall to the Ottomans. Fall of Constantinople was in 1453, uh, 29th of May, 1461, Mistra is gone. The whole, almost the whole, except for the parts which were still ruled by the Genoese and the Venetians, whole of mainland Greece is now under the Ottoman rule. Now, Vissarion had uh, caught up with uh, his teacher, Georgi Mistos Blithon, in Florence, of all places, uh, because there was the famous Council of Florence, which was convened in order to bring about the union of the Catholic and the Orthodox churches. It went for many years. Uh, the biggest, brightest and grandest uh, theologians, scholars, philosophers of their day were all enlisted to assist the Byzantine cause. Uh, Visarion was one of those practical people who could see the writing on the wall. He believed, and that again goes to his idea of Greeks being at the center of alliances, trade negotiation and diplomacy, that on practical grounds, it's probably a good thing to accept the union of the two churches under the Pope, because then he could enlist the help of the West in order to hold the Turks at bay. That was wrong too. Didn't work out. He ended up staying in Italy, so far from Trapezunda, which he loved, and uh, was appointed a cardinal by the Pope. So if you have a look at the picture where we first came across him, we can see Visario Cardinalis Nicenus. He was made the Cardinal of Nicaea, a city in Asia Minor, by the Pope. And in actual fact, he became a candidate for the papacy himself. but never actually made it to Pope because as a Greek, he was considered suspect by the rest of the Cardinals. What he did do though, was bring all his amazing knowledge of ancient Greek literature and philosophy to the West, along with extremely valuable manuscripts uh, and set up an academy in Rome where he started teaching ancient Greek literature to scholars. And it is largely through this idea and people like him that the Renaissance was able to take place and that the scholars were able to have access to ancient Greek works which had been lost or which had been unknown to the West. We owe it to him and to those like him. Now, who won in the end? Plithon, with his version of Hellenism being something confined, constricted, pure, but pretentious. Or Visarion, with his idea of Pontic Hellenism, being open, uh, syncretic, growing, evolving? And the answer is no one. It was a draw. Because as we know, Trapezunda fell in 1461, the same year as Mistra. None of the uh, Komnini Emperor's alliances, none, neither their trade uh, nor their friendships with other peoples were able to stop the final Ottoman onslaught. And we know how tragic it was. We know how the emperors were killed. We know how uh, the royal family was decimated. And we know, obviously, that this caused a chain of events over many centuries that led ultimately to the genocide of the Greeks of Pondos, uh, an event which took place in the 20th century but has its antecedents in this existential debate. Now, if you read Visarion's uh, encomium to Trebizond, the Greek in it is breathtaking. The information that he provides shows that unlike what is being said about the Byzantine era, these people really understood, knew, studied their ancient texts and were tuned in to the ancient world in a way that we've forgotten to be. We don't know how to look at that ancient world anymore as a linear progression of our world. What we do is look at it through Western eyes, reinterpret it, 
uh, by Western scholars who tell us what they think ancient Greece should be according to their ideology because they believe they are the, heir, the heirs of that tradition. Visarion looks at that and Pluthonte in his own way as a native and from there draws conclusions about his identity. Now, both Glithon and both Visarion and the debate that they engendered just before the fall of Constantinople and the fall of the Greek world to the Ottomans began a debate which continues to the present day. What does it mean to be a Greek? What does it mean to be a Pontic Greek? Why is it important that you should be a Pontic Greek? If you listen to Polython and others like him, there is no value. If you listen to Visarion, then what a Pontic Greek is, is a person who is able to preserve that core of Hellenism that he received or she received from their founding fathers and relate it, make it accessible, make it relevant to the entire world. And that's what we're trying to do when we commemorate the genocide of the Greeks of Pontos. We're trying to show how this group of people is in no way obscure, is in no way isolated, neither from the rest of Hellenism but from the world, but is a metaphor for all that is important to preserve about modern civilization, and that is diversity, tolerance, empathy, looking outward, embracing, and sharing. And these are the things that the victims of the genocide were not allowed to do. They were not allowed to share their identity. They were not allowed to enjoy communication with other people. Instead, because of who they were and what they believed in, they were slaughtered. They were not given the chance. When we discuss, uh, if you like, people who seem to be very far removed from our reality, like you say, you and like Buthon, we do it for a reason. And the reason is this. In order to, if you like, measure the magnitude and the severity of the genocide, we need to understand what was lost. And what was lost was a tradition going back to the ancient world of scholarship, intellectual rigor, and debate. It was destroyed. Um, this commitment to freedom, however, and uh, Visarion makes it very clear, this commitment to freedom, to fairness, to openness, that survived. And that survived because we saw Trapezunda becoming a hub uh, for trade again in the 19th century. Most of that trade was controlled by Greeks of the, of the region. It became a very important city politically and became a very important city economically and culturally because it was there that many Greek books were published, uh, that civilization began to spread once more, and it was cruelly cut short by what took place uh, during those terrible decades in the early 20th century. Ούτως άνωθεν ελληνικού τεφρονήματος έμπλεος ειν και την ελευθερίαν ετήμα. Thus, long our city had a Greek mentality and honoured liberty, says Visarion in his encomium. And it's these words, having a Greek mentality and honouring liberty, that we take with us so many centuries, half a millennium later, into this new land that we've come to, trying again to negotiate our identity and make it relevant to outsiders and preserving that which is important, that which we've inherited from our ancestors, sharing that with the world. So on this day, the day that we commemorate all that was lost, all the suffering, all the pain, and yes, all the anger at the fact that the world will not stand up and acknowledge what they know, that this happened, for fear of offending a tyrant, we juxtapose the tyrant with the words of a man who lived 500 years ago and say, our city, our land was a land that had a Greek mentality and honored liberty. And these are the things that we stand for, liberty and Hellenism. We will never forget. We will always commemorate them because that is our job. When we commemorate them, 
we commemorate ourselves, we commemorate our place in this world, we understand our place in the world, we know who we are and what is expected of us as Hellenes. Again, by the sea, in a place connected to so many other people, where we too bear witness to Hellenism. I hope that this short talk has given you food for thought. I hope that in terms of the identity debate which rages uh, on occasion between certain narrow-minded Greeks and not, we've enlisted an ally on our side who can basically put certain people in their place and tell them that, well, you know what? There are two types of Hellenism. There's the narrow-minded, pedantic, pure one, and there's the one that's actually relevant and lasts the distance. And our life here in this country proves that. Hope you enjoy uh, and find thought-provoking uh, the rest of the uh, proceedings tonight. Nice to Oh